Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Supporting Multilingual Learners Oral Language Development. My name is Luis Molina, and I am a policy analyst for dual language learners at Early Edge California. We are excited to partner with Peach to be able to provide you with relevant tools and resources for supporting oral language development as part of the Multilingual Learning Toolkit. Today is the second session of our three-part webinar series for higher education faculty and teachers educators. As you'll see, this will be an interactive webinar with prompts for you to engage via chat and a few other collaborative tools. Early Edge will be sending a follow-up email with a certificate of attendance and links to the recording and any other materials so that you can access the webinar. Feel free to share these resources with your colleagues as well. I would now like to introduce you to our presenters today. We have with us Ana Rambula Gonzalez, adjunct professor at Fresno City College and Dr. Guadalupe Diaz Lara, Assistant Professor at the California State University, Fullerton. And then Lupe, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Luis, for the nice introduction. And thank you all for being here with us today. What an honor and great opportunity to share with you such important information and resources to improve our practices and preparing our wonderful students and future educators. During our time today, this morning, Lupe and I will be sharing what the research says about multilingual learners' oral language development, the stages of second language acquisition, some information on translanguaging and code switching, and lastly, we will be providing you with examples of assignments that you can incorporate into your courses. Now, let's begin with what research tells us about multilingual learners' oral language development. Children's oral language and early literacy development serve as the foundation for later reading abilities and overall academic success. It is well documented that children with low language abilities are at risk for poor outcomes as they progress towards through school. The research also shows that multilingual children have two separate language learning systems early in life. Now, did you know that multilingual children's language and literacy development may differ from that of monolinguals. The good news is that multilingual children appear to catch up over time. A very important point to note is that the amount of language exposure to and usage of multilingual children's two languages plays a critical and pivotal role. During the first five years of life, children's brains develop rapidly, highly influenced by the experiences they share with the adults and peers in their lives. Exposure to language is a unique experience because it is continuous and constant. Constant exposure makes language highly consequential for brain development and learning. Now, given that children's academic success is dependent on children's early language and literacy abilities, understanding these abilities is essential. This is what research says about how multilingual children develop their language. Now, before I begin sharing some benefits, young multilingual learners, reap, I want to hear from you. What are one, two, or three benefits that children gain from speaking more than one language? At this time, I would like to ask you to please scan the QR code with your phone. It will take you to this Mentimeter page where you can type in your responses. What is one of those uh, benefits that children reap when speaking more than one language? And then um, we'll give you a couple seconds to get it um, scanned. And hopefully you are able to scan it and begin typing your responses. If scanning um, becomes um, a little difficult because of internet connections, feel free to type in the chat as well. What are the benefits of speaking more than one language? What are those benefits? 
And I don't see any responses yet. Um, but like I said, you can feel free to use the chat box as well. You get better pay. That's one of the great benefits. You have more job opportunities. And Trish just put the link in the chat as well. Um, I see more expanding knowledge. Um, children become, when children become adults, they have more job opportunities that came up again. Um, stronger problem solving skills, the ability to trust with your students who use their home language. Absolutely. A lot of benefits come with this and the increased memory as well. Absolutely. Um, and then multiple perspectives, uh, better ways to communicate as well. Um, empowerment, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much um, for using the chat. I'm not sure what happened with the Mentimeter, but our participation as faculty of higher education, we know that flexibility of different platforms to um, use to engage our students. So let's move on now. You already mentioned some of those great benefits um, that children reap. So this slide here points out and highlights um, what we know about brain development and dual language learning. We know that children's brains are wired to learn more than one language. Learning and developing in more than one language does not delay growth or development. Instead, it promotes more effective cognitive functioning and academic achievement and enhances English learning. There can be negative effects in losing one's home language. Um, so using the chat, please type, what could a negative consequence be? So what could a negative consequence be of one losing a home language? Loss of culture, absolutely. What are some other um, consequences? Loss of communication with family members, loss of identity, loss of connection with family, family, loss of confidence, uh, yes. Cannot communicate with families, what a, what a loss um, when that happens, the identity, low self-esteem. Thank you so much. And as I continue, uh, feel free to continue typing in uh, using the chat. So some of you already mentioned losing the home language can have a devastating effect on a child's identity, which will affect their learning and connections with the world around them. They cannot communicate or socialize with other family members if they don't speak the language. And unfortunately, we see this happening a lot. In fact, most adults wish that their parents or family members had spoken to them in their home language during childhood. Our home language is our heart language and the language we use to connect with our family members, grandparents, siblings, friends, and other adults, and even children. As professors in higher education, we need to continue to share this message with our future educators so they can share with families the importance of supporting and maintaining their home language. Home language is linked to children's identity, which is connected to a sense of belonging. When a child's home language is supported, the child feels more comfortable with the adults and children in the program they attend. This feeling of comfort is extremely important because during these early years, children build a foundation and understanding of who they are. We now know what research says and the importance of supporting children's oral language development using their home language. We will now transition to the stages a multilingual learner goes through as they acquire a second language. Now, before we begin, let's do another fun and interactive activity using Kahoot. And I will now share my screen. And so here, what we're going to do is I'm going to start the game and hopefully this one works. Um, I'm going to ask you to scan the QR code once it populates, or you can also log on to Kahoot on your phone or your uh, computer or any electronic device to begin playing this game. So get ready to join. So you can join at www.kahoot.it. 
or using the Kahoot app. And this is our PIN number. So um, you can use that platform or you can just scan the QR code. So it says it's waiting for players to join. I see someone there already. And we are going to play this game to get a thermometer check on to see how familiar you are with the stages of second language acquisition. So I see a lot of you are joining. Thank you so much. Twenty-one. Give it a couple more seconds. There's five of us. And some of you may use this platform in your um, courses that you teach. And it's a fun and interactive way to get students uh, engaged. Okay, I think we've been at 25 for a couple of seconds. So, oh, there's more, okay. okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, start the game and let's uh, see how familiar you are all with uh, the second stages of second language acquisition. So I'm going to start it. There we go. The first language stage is and select. Awesome. So between home language and the observational stage. So let's go to the next question. The second language stage is the language, observational, the graphic. Observational, yay. Let's go to the third stage. The third language stage is The graphic, absolutely, that is correct. Let's go to the last stage. The fourth language stage is. Fluid, that is correct. Thank you all for participating in this fun and interactive way. Um, sorry, game, as we begin to um, transition to those four stages of second language acquisition that children go through. So the first stage is the home language stage. This is when children use their home language to communicate with other children and adults. Children in this stage only use the language they know. These children don't comprehend English and only speak their home language, whatever that language may be. Children in this stage come to us with varied skills and talents, and some children are in the home language stage either um, because they've come to the United States or grew up in a home where English is not spoken. So those are your children in the home language stage. And in the observational stage, the children, the child in this stage does not speak. Instead, they are listening, absorbing, and observing language. At times, some adults and even parents think that children who are learning more than one language are not responding because they are confused. The truth of the matter is the child is observing and listening. They are processing the information they are hearing. Children in this stage are spending most of their energy listening to make sense of their new language. Um, they are observing those gestures and environmental cues associated with this new language that they are learning. 
In the telegraphic stage, children are producing language. They are trying to make meaning of this new language that they are learning. Telegraphic speech refers to the use of a few content words. Uh, for example, children are using words to describe actions, possessions, or locations. They are listening and again, absorbing and observing language. They are trying to make meaning of the new language. And children in this stage are using one or two or three words, um, but not speaking full sentences in that other language. And in the last stage, the fluid stage, children in this stage are now conversationalists. They are uh, engaging in conversations uh, with other children, with other adults, they're producing language and they become more comfortable and begin to engage with those conversations with adults and other children. They are conversationalists. This is what we want to strive for with all of our children who are learning a second language. We will now watch four clips that demonstrate this continuum of bilingualism. And before we watch this video, um, I want you to think about these four language stages that um, you participated in the Kahoot, but also that I just reviewed. And once the video ends, then I will ask you to type in the chat, what language stage do you think um, Soyul is? So we'll see Soyul, she's a student, and teacher Yvette in all four videos that we are going to be watching. They are going to be short videos. And so once each video ends, if you can please just again, type in the chat, uh, what language stage is Soyul in as we watch these four video clips? So let's see. stage do you think Soyul is in this video that we just watched? And you can type in the chat, home language. That is correct. She is in the home language. And we saw how the teacher tries to figure out what Soyul is telling her in her home language by using the building blocks. The teacher shows Soyul the building block and asks her, is this Toki Jeep? And Soyul nods her head, yes. And so when multilingual children are in the home language stage, it is important that the educators um, use those visuals to try to figure out what the child is telling um, them in their home language, especially when the educator doesn't speak the language of the child. This sends a message to the child that you care for them and that you are trying to figure out what it is that the child needs. So let's watch another short um, video. And again, once the video ends, we'll... Um, if you can type in the chat what language stage uh, Soyul is in. Animals have ears. Do you have ears? Where's your ear? Where's your ear? Do you have ears? Yeah? They come in all shapes and sizes. This dog has floppy ears, animal noises. What's this say? A puppy. That's right, Taylor. Thank you. Oh, look at this one. Bird. Bird says, tweet, 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 tweet. Cat. Cat says, what does cat say, so you? Cat says, ruff, ruff. Or meow. Cat says. Okay. So what language stage do you think Soyul is in um, this short clip? The observational stage, the second stage. 
That is correct. So we just watched uh, this short clip where teacher Yvette is reading a book to Soyul and other children who are nearby. Soyul doesn't say not one word, but the teacher continues to include her while she reads this story. And many educators may think that children in the observational stage are confused or lost. The reality is that they are processing both languages and are not quite ready to engage in dialogue with other children or adults. So thank you everyone who participated in the chat. Let's watch a third video. having a show over there? Yeah. Oh, are you feeling my finger? I said, can I feel? Look at me over here. Can I feel your finger? Yeah, your thumb. My thumb. Should we sing a song? Where is Thumbkin? Where is Thumbkin? Here I am, here I am. How are you today, sir? Very well, I thank you. Run away, run away. Who's next? Ready? Where is Ringman? Where is Ringman? Here I am. This one. There it is. Here I am. How are you today, sir? Very well, I think. Hey, there he is. Help? Underneath Pinky. Put Pinky underneath. There you go. Run away. Run away. Who's next? Pinky? Pinky? Can you say Pinky? No? Oh, help. Okay, say it louder. Ready? I'm gonna go like this. So look at my finger. Put this down. Good. Put our thumb. Oh, you got it. Good, hold it up. Here I am. Here I am. How are you today, sir? Very well, I thank you. Wow. Good job. What other song? I think it's just important, you know, it's not about, I mean, I was a Spanish speaker when I was. Okay. So after watching these couple minutes of teacher Yvette and Soyul, what language stage do you think um, Soyul is in? So you could type using the chat, the telegraphic. That is correct. And so in this video, we so we see teacher Yvette and Soyul singing, where is Thumpkin? Soyul is following along. And when she felt she needed help, she said help to Yvette. So Soyul is beginning to use single words to get her ideas across to her teacher to let her know what she needs. This is very common for children. And again, it doesn't imply that children um, are confused or lost. They are learning to separate the use of the languages they know. So let's watch the last video and we will, um, I will ask you if you can please type in the chat what stage Soyul is in. So can you tell me something else you learned in ballet? Have your leg up on up this way. And how, why do you need to put your leg up this way? And the back way. And the back way. So one leg goes forward and one goes back. Yeah, my mommy helped me and my daddy holds it. Really? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. So that's why your mom and dad needed to help you? Yeah. Are you practicing at home? Oh. Do you have any special things you wear for ballet? What do you wear for ballet? Um, ballet. Um, ballet clothes. Ballet clothes. What does it look like? Pink. It's pink? Yeah, and we have pink dragons. 
And pink treasures. Too. And then pink flowers. Pink flowers. What else do you wear for ballet? So what stage do you think Soyul is in? I see that someone already typed fluid. She's in the fluid stage. Fluid. That is correct. And this is the stage we want all multilingual learners to be in. We want them to be conversationalists. However, to help a multilingual learner get to this stage, first educators need to be able to identify the stage they are in in order to fully support their home language as they develop English. As I mentioned earlier, you can do this activity with your students in your class and it provides students an opportunity to practice seeing videos and make connections with children in their own classrooms who may be learning a second language. So now, uh, if you were with us in our first webinar, we did create a Padlet um, page where you can add your um, ideas as Lupe and I share with you some examples of assignments that you can implement in your, in your courses. So at this time, if you would like to scan this QR code and also Trish is going to put the link in the chat, um, this Padlet is going to be available um, after the webinar and you can still add your ideas to the Padlet. We will have it available for the duration of the three webinars. And I noticed that after our first webinar, a lot of um, our participants went back and added um, ideas for assignments um, connected to what um, Giselle and I had shared in the first webinar. So I encourage you to share your ideas with us after today's session as well. So let's begin with our first uh, assignment example. So this assignment here is an example of how you can use video to have students complete a video reflection. The video that will be used for this assignment is called Complex Oral Language and can be found on the Multilingual Learning Toolkit website. So for example, if you're teaching a course online, you can use this video and have students watch the entire video uh, during class, ask students to take notes and create a list of strategies that stood out to them as they watch the video. Ask students to list those strategies that they would like to implement currently in their classroom as they watch the video. Or if they're not in a classroom yet, ask them to share what strategies they hope to implement in their classroom one day that they learned about. So after students have watched the video, they've jotted down their responses, um, put students in breakout rooms of two to three students, depending on how large your class is, and have students conversate and share what stood out to them and what they hope to implement in their classroom. So these breakout rooms, I would suggest um, for 10 minutes. And then once the breakout rooms close, invite a few groups to share what they discussed in their breakout rooms with the entire class. And so now if you are teaching a course in person, you would follow the same steps I just mentioned. However, instead of putting students in breakout rooms, ask students to get in groups of two to three and conversate and share what stood out to them, what they hope to implement in their classrooms and do this for about 10 minutes and then invite a few um, groups to share out loud with the entire class. And I will say this video is a great video because it shows children and educators in action, especially because currently students have limited access to classrooms due to COVID, guidelines that a lot of programs um, have implemented and using videos like this one allows students to see what it looks like in a classroom supporting multilingual learners when they are not able to visit. So that's one example of an assignment. And the second assignment that you see here can be used um, the same way for online or in-person teaching using the same assignment format. So the goal for this assignment is for students to practice using dialogic reading strategies to support multilingual learners oral language development while reading storybooks. So for this assignment, I would recommend to have students read the handout, Dialogic Read Aloud. Trish just put the link um, in the chat. And after they have read this handout, have students read, um, sorry, watch the video, Pre-K Dialogic Read Aloud Little Red Hen. And this video is about nine minutes. And so once students have read the handout, watched the video, now ask them to do the following. Ask students to select a book 
This can be any book. It can connect with the theme that they are currently studying or an interest of the children in their program. Once they've selected that book, they're going to select two to three vocabulary words that they plan to introduce to the children as they read the book. Also have students write down three questions that connect to the book and children's personal experiences. We always want to make sure that those questions that we are asking children um, connect with um, their personal experiences. And so after the student has done these three items, then students will record themselves reading the book, introducing the vocabulary words, and asking those questions that they jotted down. Now, the recording should not include students, and this is just for confidentiality, and must be 15 minutes. Remember that the purpose for this assignment is to get students comfortable using these dialogic reading strategies. And providing some exam assignments such as this one allows students the opportunity to apply and demonstrate what they learn by applying these dialogic reading strategies in their practice. Even if they are not in, currently in a classroom working with students, um, with children, with this assignment will prepare them for when that day comes. And this assignment, I will say, may be a bit challenging for some students who do not feel comfortable recording themselves. However, remind your students that you are the only one watching the video and providing them with feedback. And this feedback um, is going to support them in their own practices with young children. So let's move on to another assignment example. So this assignment um, here that you see is another great resource that is available on the Multilingual Learning Toolkit website. It's called Strategies in Action. This particular vignette is about teacher Laura, who has been teaching in a school-based transitional kindergarten program for five years. She is implementing strategies to support, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I think we lost Trish, but I will continue on. She is implementing strategies to support her multilingual learners in her classroom. This vignette illustrates clearly that supporting children's home language is critical. Not only is it critical, it's necessary in order to immerse children in rich learning experiences. And so an example of how this vignette can be used uh, for in-person teaching is to have students read the setting and the lesson and you can provide students with the link and or provide them with a copy or have the document um, displayed on your whiteboard for students to read. Ask students to respond to the reflection questions. Each vignette has three reflection questions, so you don't have to come up with reflection questions for, this, um, for any of these vignettes that are available. Now, after students have responded to the reflection questions, have them share their reflections with other students during class and allow students to conversate for about 10 minutes um, with each other. So putting, putting students in groups of two to three um, is a good size so that it allows an opportunity for more conversations and more sharing to take place. And once those 10 minutes are up, you can ask each group to share out loud with the entire class. Now, if you're teaching online, um, you can also use this vignette. So you can provide students with the link to the vignette um, ask them to read the setting, um, the, respond to those reflection questions, and give them about 15 minutes uh, to do this, and then create breakout rooms of two to three students per breakout room, and give them 10 minutes uh, so that they can share um, the responses to those reflection questions. And then once those 10 minutes are up, allow students an opportunity or select different breakout groups to share out loud with everyone. The questions to this vignette provide a pathway for educators supporting multilingual learners. The questions um, invite the educator to reflect on the specific vignette, but also to reflect on their own teaching practices. I personally highly recommend you uh, visit the Multilingual Learning Toolkit website for more vignettes. They have them for different um, stages of development. Um, and they are a great way to provide students with different scenarios, especially if they don't have access to the classroom. And again, if you have any other ideas on how this vignette or any of the assignment uh, examples that I have provided you, please share them on the Padlet. I will now pass it on to my friend and colleague, Lupe, who will be sharing with us uh, some rich information. 
Good morning, everybody. I am really excited to be here with you today. I want to thank Anna for inviting me to come and share some of the assignments and activities and information that I provide to my students in their, you know, to get help them understand translanguaging, code switching, narratives, development. So as um, I'll wait for our, our presentation to come on. So uh, I'm going to be sharing some content with you, content with you, as well as how I share this with my with my students. So we're going to start with what is translanguaging and what are the connections to code switching. So uh, if you can, if you can just pop up all the all the parts of this slide, it's I think it's, it's animated. So um, before we start, I want to share with you if you can put it in the chat. What I like to do, or what I like to call, is like an ex expert's notebook, or um, it's also like a processing journal or a guided notes for my students to to be engaged and have a place to write down their notes as I'm asking them questions. I have found that this was really helpful, especially in my asynchronous class, as well as what, when I was teaching over Zoom. Uh, in my Zoom class, it kept students engaged and gave them a place to write down as opposed to just be listening or watching videos. In my asynchronous class, it gives uh, students um, a guide for what to, what to follow, or what to what to be looking out for when um, uh, when they're listening to our lecture recordings or they're watching a video. So we're gonna start, um, and you can download that um, from the link I gave you. You can use it to write down now, or you know, since we are in Zoom, you can use it in the chat, and I'll be sharing also a Jamboard and let you know how I use that for my students. So before we start, you can either in the chat. Um, if you can share the, the Jambo link to Trish, that would be great. Uh, if you can write down just what do you already know about translanguaging and code switching? Um, and I start this with my students to get an idea of what they already know, what ideas that they have about the topic that we're discussing. And I always let them know, I don't know anything, it's an acceptable answer. And this is to make them comfortable, especially if it's something that I haven't given them anything to read about. I make it, make sure that they know that it's okay to say, I don't know anything about this. I have no idea. Just as a way to make them comfortable um, in, in saying, I don't know. And knowing that it, my classroom is a safe space for, say, for them to say, I don't know, and to ask questions. So I'm going to give you a little bit, uh, just a few uh, minutes or so. If you can either type what you already know about translanguaging and code switching uh, in the Jamboard or in the chat. The Jamboard, what, this is a strategy that I implemented uh, in my when I was teaching on Zoom in uh, spring. So I had a lot of, you know, you have the students that are on Zoom and you have a few who are just uh, a few that participate and they talk a lot and all of that, but then you have others who really don't say anything. So I implemented the Jamboard students where they could submit questions without putting their name, their comment and comments and something about it not being attached to their name has really helped. It really increased my students' participation in Zoom. And for my asynchronous class, I told them to just open the Jamboard and as they were reading or listening to lecture, to post in their questions there. And that is a way for them to think through what questions do I have instead of having to wait to put them on later or ask them later or in asynchronous class to ask them where, you know, either email me or put them in our like, coffee questions section. It's a way for me to uh, get to their questions right away. So we're gonna read out a few of the answers and somebody said, I don't know anything. Thank you for, I really appreciate that. Uh, the uses of our languages that a person speaks, it's normal, healthy part of bilingualism. And a few on the Jamboard that said code switching is a window into what a child knows about language and he or she uses shows use of grammar and vocabulary, utilizes the strengths in both languages, allows a person or child to adapt to different environments. So all of these are great responses. And I know that there is uh, 
sometimes a lot of confusion around what's translanguaging, what's code switching, what's the difference, what do we need to look at? So Trish, if we could go to the next slide. So another thing that I do is that I, for me, I use short videos to for my students to get uh, to add to the explanations or the reading or the lecture that I'm using. And one of the videos that I love to use are from Dr. Jose Medina and his TikTok for me has become a goldmine. So we're going to watch um, this. It's two parts because TikTok limits how long your videos can be uh, of him explaining seeing what is translanguaging and their connections to code switching. Uh, and uh, is if you see in the um, You'll see that I also give my students uh, guiding questions of what do I want them to look at while they're uh, what while they're looking at the presentation. Um, so I lost the the presentation, so I don't remember what the guiding questions were in there. So Trish, if you can put them in the chat, that will be great. But you know, so I, since I I can't see the presentation anymore um, on my end. Uh, I just, as he's talking about, I want you to think through what did you, what is different from the definition that you had, or what is something that you learned about from his video about translanguaging and code switching that you didn't know before, and then we'll come back and share. So Trish, you can go ahead and play the first part of the video. Dr. Medina, is translanguaging the same thing as code switching? And the answer is no. It is not. And so I wanted to clarify because there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation in our field right now in terms of translanguaging research. Translanguaging is really just about moving language from our one linguistic repertoire based on the context, based on the need for communication at that moment. And so um, all of us translanguage. If you're monolingual, you translanguage because you move language features from your one linguistic bubble, your one language repertoire based on specific context. The only thing that's different is that those of you that are monolingual only have one nation language that is represented within that one linguistic repertoire. Someone who is bilingual or multilingual, they have more than one nation language represented within that one linguistic repertoire. Here's where it gets interesting and why translanguaging research is so important in schools and specifically within a US context. Because in the US, we are intrinsically a part of a linguistically oppressive system where if students are not able to language in English, then historically it doesn't matter. And so when a child who is monolingual English speaking enters a US classroom, they are able to access all of their linguistic repertoire because most of what we value is English. But an emergent bilingual or multilingual child, they come into a US classroom and we immediately want them to language in English. And so we ask them only to leverage that which is in English, meaning that they're only able to access less than 50% of their linguistic repertoire. What translanguaging research proposes and posits is that we need to leverage all that a student brings into the space so that they're able to make those cross linguistic connections and language all of their deep content understanding in more than one language. Ah, switching, alternating between two or more languages is only one way out of an infinite number of ways that we can move language. So if you language in Spanglish or Chinglish or African American vernacular, all of that languaging is beautiful and perfect and a leverage all that a child brings into the classroom linguistically so that they're able to fully embrace all of their learning. Mira, mira. Again, translanguaging, moving language from our one linguistic repertoire, code switching one out of an infinite number of ways that we can move language based on that context. I hope that helps. Adios. Lupe, you're on mute. 
that I'm on mute. As you can see, his uh, short videos really kind of get to the point and it gives students a different way to think about it. And he has just a, a range of videos on, on topics around language and social justice and, and equity. Um, Trish, can we go back to the presentation? Thank you. So if you can just go ahead and pull up the so one of the things that I do with my students, and I will share, uh, I'll have, uh, I'll put in the Padlet the guiding questions that I provided with my students for this. The other thing that I do is uh, showing my students what does it look like, and this is something that Anna um, showed, right, where she showed those videos. Um, so these are just the depth, the what is translanguaging, moving language from our linguistic repertoire based on the context, and then underneath that is a more technical definition. I'll, I'll share with you as well the citation that he had in his video to the articles where he was that he, you know, that he was using as a reference. Um, I also have these like, what does it look like uh, points? What does it look like for so students can picture it? And a lot of these can be found in the multilingual toolkit website, uh, where there is different, there is a whole resource on translanguaging, what does it look like that you can use as a resource to to use this in your classroom. Can you go to the next slide? And you can just pop them up again. I, I didn't, you know, it didn't occur to me that I wasn't going to be the one controlling the presentation and that, you know, I probably shouldn't have added that animation, but you'll learn it's part of teaching, right? So, and I, and I did the same thing here with code switching. And again, all these are resources that you can use, that you can find on the multi-learning toolkit website. Uh, so to give your students like the definition of code switching and what does that look like? Next slide, please. So we're gonna go on to another activity that I use for, uh, to build knowledge around my, like a foundation of knowledge around my students, as well as get an idea of how they're thinking about these topics. And you'll see as I talk more about other examples of assignments that a very important piece of my um, lecture and coursework is getting students to reflect and think through their own bias, their own thinking, where the narratives that they have about students and families uh, come from. So I use this uh, that is called, um, yes, I agree, no, I don't, or maybe. And I give, um, if you could go to, to the next slide. I give my students a number of uh, statements and I ask them to tell me whether they agree with this statement, they don't agree, or maybe they do, maybe they, they don't, they're not sure. Uh, I use the Mentimeter to, to do this. I use Zoom. If I am online, I have my, my students um, uh, just uh, stand around the room. And that can be challenging for some of them, but you know, usually once they get comfortable, they're okay with it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we are going to do a Mentimeter. And you can go to uh, here, menti.com and use this code. So Trish, if you can put that in the, in the chat. And I want you to say yes, no, maybe, or yes, is I agree, no, I don't agree, or maybe, and you can say children can lose their native language during their preschool years. And if you are having issues, um, again, it seems like Mentimeter might not want to cooperate today. We can just do in the chat if you're having issues. So I see somebody said yes, somebody said maybe. So we can um, wait a few more and see. See that a few more seconds. And again, you can use the chat, I mean, the Mentimeter or the chat, either one is fine. So most of you are saying yes, we have one or two maybes between the chat. Okay. So can, if you said maybe, can you type in the chat why you said maybe? Or if you said yes or no, um, can you type a little bit, just a few little, why, why did you choose the response that you chose? 
And usually with my student, I'll say, if you responded yes, why did you say yes? If you responded maybe, why did you say baby? Uh, and if you responded no, and I'm nobody, I haven't seen any no's, so. Or maybe, no, I haven't seen any no's. If they're not using it, they can lose it. Any, anybody else who said maybe? Depends on what kind of program they attend, whether home language continues, ratio of time and its language. So for this, we would, uh, I would explain to students that it's actually maybe, right? It really does depend on the support that they're getting on their, on their native or their home language, right? We want to emphasize that it is true that because they can lose it if they are not getting a, the support that they need, but it really does depend on the program and the supports that they're getting. Like somebody should say yes, because when a new language introduced, they can lose their fifth language. And that is true, they can use it, but it depends because it depends on the supports that they, um, that they are getting to, for, their, uh, for their language. So the next one, and we're gonna try just one more, and again, it's the same thing, the same code, is uh, if parents speak their first native or home language, however you wanna refer to it, to their children, they're going to learn English more like slowly. No. No, I see lots and lots of no's. So, so for this one, we would still, we, this is something that sadly, I, you know, I do a lot of work with parents and this is, it's just a myth that parents are still very concerned about, right? Like I shouldn't be speaking their home language. So we would tell st students, no. Right, it's okay for parents to speak their home language to their kids. That's a good thing. So this is this is you know kind of the example um, that we give uh, students. And now you you have a little bit of an idea of how to do that activity. Trish, if we can go back to the PowerPoint, and you can create these statements to make them easier or harder or whatever that might you know whatever that might that might be. Uh, and I, you can use the multilingual toolkit and just edit these statements to make them either, you know, yes, no, maybe, or yes, I agree, no, or whatever, whatever you want to do. The other piece that I emphasize to my students is the importance of connections to development. You know, I, although many, many of my students want to be teachers, and it, it's important that I understand the their teaching practice and uh, the different strategies to teach, part of the teaching practice needs to be understanding development, okay? So I don't know how well you could see this, but this is a example that I use that is from Dr. Scamilla, her literacy square. And um, uh, I want you to take a look at it and tell me on a scale of one to 10, what score would you assign this writing? So this is a student that they asked her, if you could be somebody else for one day, who would you be? And what do you notice about their writing? You can put it in the chat or you can put it in the, um, on the Jamboard, whatever, whatever you feel more comfortable with. They're based on the sounds of the words, yep. Thank you, Lisa. So, and this is something where, you know, when I was reading uh, over some of these examples is we tend to go to like, mm, the writing is poor, it makes no sense, it's grammatically incorrect, blah, 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 we know whatever it is. But these are uh, based on those phonetic of the sounds, those are approximations and they're, then we wanna see them as that, approximations, not errors, right? So this is a connection to their cognitive development. And I, I know I don't know how many of you were able to read this, but the, what this says is I would want to be Juan Carlos. I like him because he's proficient in math. I was mostly the dumbest kid, but as years went by, I got smarter. Now I'm back where I was all over again. I really hate that because I'm really stupid. Plus, I'm partially proficient in math, and Juan is proficient in math, and I'm unsatisfactory in writing and reading. Him too, but he's a lot smarter than me. I'm stupidest in the whole entire school. The truth is, the tr that's the truth. That's, that's why I wanna be him. 
That is the truth. I never told anybody this. I haven't told a soul. So in addition to really looking at the, you know, the focusing on the grammar, and again, it's thinking through students' cognitive development, social emotional development, there is clearly something going on with this child, right? For them to be, they feel like they're dumb and they're stupid. So we wanna, uh, we wanna look at those pieces. And I know somebody say, depends on what's being assessed. So, but what I want you to, when we look at these, what I want to encourage you to do is that, you know, you, we always have like, I'm assessing this and this, but pay attention to other things, right? If we were looking at grammar, it might be like, oh, this grammar is terrible. But we want to look at those as approximations and not, not as errors. And this is, again, helps to challenge students into how do we work with the students? What do we see as their strengths? Where can we offer support? Uh, and again, making those connections to what is going on in their cognitive development, are they using those approximations, right? So I remember when I came to the US and I used to write down the, T-H-E, I will write D-A, right? And that was an approximation of the sounds. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, the other piece that I do with my students, and I know we're running you know, a little bit short in time, is that I ask, I help, I challenge them to hear like the narrative that we have about um, students in the classroom. And I like to use this article by Dr. Nexon Flores, and I just give him the first piece and we'll share the full article with you. And I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna read to you just the first piece, but I'll have Trish, if you could put the link, the links in the, in the chat. And I want you to think about what is the author's message? What is it, what do you wanna add? And how does the author, author message impact the way we think about monolingual children? So I'm gonna read you just the, a, you know, a little piece of uh, the article. It is well documented. It is a well documented fact that by the age of five, monolingual white children would have heard 30 million fewer words in languages other than other other than English than bilingual children of color. In addition, they will, they will have had complete lack of exposure to the richness of non-standardized varieties of English that characterize the homes of many children of color. This language gap increases the older these children are in school. The question is what, is, what causes this language gap and what can be done? The major cause of this language gap is the failure of monolingual white communities to successfully assimilate into the monolingual and multidialectic mainstream. The continued existence of white ethnic enclaves persists despite concerted efforts to integrate white communities into multiracial mainstream since the 1960s. In this linguistic isolated enclaves, it is possible to go days without interacting with anybody who doesn't speak standardized American English, providing little incentive for the inhabitants to adapt to the multilingual and multidialect nature of society. The, this linguistic isolation has detrimental effect on the cognitive development of monolingual white children. And he goes on and on, but you know, tell me if you, we have a few minutes, put it in the chat. What do you think of his message? It's powerful, right? And this is a, an activity that I share with my students because this is something, uh, you know, and it depends. Some students was like, that is so wrong. Why are we talking about kids like this? This is the way we talk about bilingual children all the time. But then when we put it on these other ones, uh, on this, on the term of monolingual children, then we tend to be outraged, right? Like, how dare we talk about these children this way? So this is a way that I help my students reflect and challenge the narrative that they hear about multilingual children. So, and we'll be sharing that with you. Um, you know, I'll share the full link uh, at the end of our, our webinar. Um, so, can we go through the next slide? And you can just bring them all up. Uh, so. As you could see, one of the things that I do with my students is to get them to reflect about this connection between language, development, social justice and equity to their practice, right? So especially when it comes to language, we can't think about having serving and multilingual learners and teaching them in a way that is gonna support them without thinking about equity and social justice. So I give my students a lot of time to reflect 
a lot of time to think about where are the where are where are our narratives coming from? Where did we hear them? And then we I give them um, at the end of lecture. I usually we give them a, like what is your brightest point and what is your muddiest. So this is a way for them to tell me what is something that they really know that they feel they really understand and what is something that is still a little muddy they don't quite get it and then they're shared with the partner in a breakout room it also gives me a sense an opportunity to see where the patterns are of things that they didn't understand next slide so this is just our summary slide uh the looks at you know many of the things that we um already said the importance of looking at language development and connecting that to equity and social justice by confronting our own bias and thinking of the narrative that we have. I think that is all I have for you to share for you today. And I think we're gonna go ahead and go to the Q&A. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and um, skip the Q&A, but we want to thank you all for joining us, especially thank you, Anna and Lupe, for sharing about these great strategies and resources. Please take a moment to complete our short evaluation survey. We will be sharing the link in the chat with you. And thank you all who joined us. We hope that this has been a positive learning experience for you today. We hope to see you at our third and final session focus on social emotional health and development on July 27th. Stay tuned for a follow-up email to access the resources from this webinar and your certificate of attendance. Thank you all.